Welcome to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canaan, and we are broadcasting live on August 22nd from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. Today on the show, we have a couple of topics. Later on, we're going to hear about a new group. It's called Parenting with Pride. They're a progressive response to the right-wing group Moms for Liberty. But first, we're going to get an update coming out of the new College of Florida in Sarasota. The latest is that students will be sent to a third hotel to live. This one is about four miles from campus. And joining me by Zoom this hour are guests, Mike Sanderson, who is a new college alum, and Stephen Walker, who is education reporter at the Sarasota Herald Tribune. He's been reporting extensively on Sarasota School Board and on this year's quickly moving developments at New College of Florida. So I want to welcome both of you to Tuesday Cafe, Mike and Stephen. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for having me. I'm really glad both of you could come on. Thanks so much for joining us. So we'll talk a lot about the changes that are happening at New College during this interview, but the latest has to do with the school closing some dorms and forcing most juniors and seniors to live in hotels. Stephen, why don't you take it from there with what's the latest we know about the living situation for students at New College of Florida? Yeah, so a little bit of background. Um, earlier this summer, I believe it was in May, um, New College of Florida commissioned a report, um, its first of two reports on all of the buildings in on campus. And that report, you know, was a facilities report examining, you know, a lot of different aspects. But one thing it did mention was that the pay dorms, all three of them, were um, virtually in, uninhabitable. Uh, even in the May report, it said that. And when they took they took that information and they started making arrangements to, uh, you know, facilitate off-campus housing for students. And this was in discussions back in May to June. Um, a lot of it not communicated with students, at least very openly. There was public meetings, but nothing like sent to students. Housing arrangements were changed very consistently with students wondering, not really knowing where they would actually live. Um, students were being sent into the pay dorms. Uh, specifically upperclassmen who were coming back to new college were being assigned to pay dorms when they should have been or were already assigned to upperclassmen dorms of Dort and Goldstein, which are apartment style dorms that are newer and more recently built. Um, so that's where they were assigned. And because of the influx of athletes and first year students to new college of Florida, the college made the decision to assign those students to Dorton Goldstein and reassign upperclassmen to pay dorms, despite the report saying that there were they were complete, like virtually uninhabitable. And then again, another second report just backed up the same claim that the first report said, which was that there you can't live in them. And so they've been coordinating with several hotels, one of which is the Home Two Suites, which is about a quarter mile north of campus. That hotel. Um, they have established a contract already that's been approved by the board of trustees. It's about $1.6 million uh, for students to live there. They've also um, apparently come to an agreement with Hilton right next to it to house students and the Hyatt Regency, which is about four miles south of campus in downtown Sarasota, right on the Bayfront. And it's a four-star hotel, but those contracts haven't emerged. It's unclear um, specifically with the Hyatt Regency, how much that's going to cost new college or students. And right now it's not immediately clear what transportation they're offering um, from what I'm getting from a lot of people texting me and sending me updates via email. Nothing I've like reported yet on, you know, a story uh, with the Herald Tribune, but just like things I'm collecting ahead of time now. Um, it doesn't seem like they have a plan right now. Like they want to offer transportation, but there's no transportation plan right now. Um, and specifically, that's an issue for a lot of students who may not have off camp, uh, like transportation, and they're going to be living four miles off campus, which is about an hour and a half walk, a 30 minute bike ride, or pretty expensive Ubers every day to school if there's no transportation. So that's the current state is that there's three different hotels. Um, the upperclassmen specifically will be from my understanding, in the Hyatt Regency, there are first-year students who are not athletes in hotels uh, at the Home Two and Hilton hotels, and then you know second years as well are up there. And specifically, the on-campus 
are mostly freshmen and athletes. And that's the current state of things right now as a uh, hotel move-in started on Sunday. Um, and the Hyatt Regency specifically, their move-in starts tomorrow morning. Um, and I will be there. <laughs> so, yeah. That's the voice of Stephen Walker, education reporter at Sarasota Herald Tribune. We're talking about New College of Florida. He's been reporting extensively on this year's developments there. We also have as a guest, Mike Sanderson, who is a New College alum. And Mike, one of the things that you've been posting about is how students would get from these hotels to campus. You posted a photo of a chain linked fence along US busy US 41. You also posted a, a, a photo that had a sign warning about wildlife. Why don't you tell us about what the routes would be like if people decided, if students decided to walk from these hotels to campus? Yeah, and that's where it was on August 10th, where it was the home to stay, which is relatively close to campus, but which there are only two routes. One, um, a nature trail, which passes through some wooded areas. And as you said, has signs warning of uh, alligators and snakes and don't stay on the trail. And then the other route is along US 41, which um, near the airport on the Sarasota Bradenton area is not a safe area to walk in, particularly at night. Um, and at one point is between a chain link fence and traffic that's going, you know, 40, 50 miles an hour. So um, that is just the home to stay, which was discussed at the Board of Trustees meeting August 10th. And what really the the returning students and their parents are really suffering because this is just, you know, days before they're supposed to move in, like less than two weeks before classes. They're getting for the second time this summer, learning that their housing arrangements have been invalidated and they don't know where they're supposed to move to. They don't know how they're going to get to uh, the cafeteria to eat. Will they be eligible for meal plans? They're learning these things from press releases. Um, and it's hard to say if the, the lack of communication from the interim administration is just out of uh, incompetence or indifference or intentionally malicious to create this effect and try to drive returning students to not come back, several of which have decided in the past few weeks to not come back. And it's just really a deeply upsetting situation for a lot of people here. And it's it's very unnecessary because, as noted, the condition of the pay dorms, which are the traditional freshman dorms because of the arrangement, um, that's been known for some time. Uh, so to blame the previous administration and say there wasn't a plan to fix them, the previous administrations concluded that the construction made it very difficult to fix. So it's not that they didn't create a plan. It's that they concluded that this was a crisis anyway. But um, regardless, to have you know, told students um, just your housing is invalidated and you're going to go to these dorms and then less than days before you're supposed to move in, you're going to a hotel. There hasn't been information about the Hyatt um, Regency until uh, just uh, just last week. So it's really a deeply upsetting situation, not just because of the conditions, uh, but also the communication and the the continual mixed messages that have left people just really scrambling upset. Where are, their, where are they and their kids going to live? How are they going to eat? Are they going to be in danger traveling to and from class? You know, this is really a, a terrible situation that's unfolding here over the summer. And if this sounds familiar to anyone, we have been talking, you know, throughout the summer and throughout the spring semester as well about the changes at New College of Florida. And just a little bit over a month ago, I had a student on and I had the parent of a of a student on talking about the the big housing issues at the time, but they've even changed. They've even gotten kind of more complex since then. Last week, the interim the, the college sent out a, a a press release that had quotes in it from the interim president, Richard Corcoran. The college wrote that the housing exceeds the quality at most other schools, here referring to the housing in the, the hotels that they're referring to. But we've also been learning, uh, and maybe, um, Stephen, you can fill us in on this. What are some of the restrictions that students face if they are assigned to one of these hotels instead of a traditional dorm on campus? That's right. You mentioned restrictions. And when when you said that the college had been kind of touting, like, oh, we're putting students up in a four star hotel on the Bayfront, like that's kind of awesome. And it's like, yeah, I mean, it's a great hotel and a great location, but a college student isn't on vacation. They're on campus. They're trying to study. And that's, I guess, the advantage of a lot of like, at least the door and Goldstein buildings from my conversations with students are the ideal location for upperclassmen because of their proximity to libraries and how on campus they are actually like they are there on the Bayfront side. And uh, being four miles from campus is very, you know, limiting in terms of you really just feel off 
campus because you really are. But in terms of like living in a dorm versus living in a hotel room, you know, a dorm room, you can make your own, really, you can, you can bring decorations, you can have people over, you can br uh, bring appliances uh, to cook in your dorm room, however limited that may be. But um, the terms of the contract, at least with home two suites, uh, and I would assume this would probably extend to other hotels is these students are not allowed to decorate their rooms. It says explicitly they're not supposed to hang decorations on the walls or, you know, alter the room in any way. Uh, they are not allowed to bring any appliances such as a microwave, a toaster oven, coffee pots, you know, a hot plate to help, or, you know, an air fryer, things that you can maybe cook your own food with. A lot of these hotels, I would say, yeah, all of them don't have kitchenettes. Uh, they're, we're talking like a mini fridge and a, and a Keurig coffee machine if maybe um, room service such as uh, DoorDash and Grubhub, um, they're prohibited. You can't order DoorDash to your door. Um, students can't have alcohol on property and can't host parties. Um, the alcohol also extends to even if you're 21, ob obviously not if you're before, <laughs> if you're younger than 21, but if you are of legal age, you still can't have alcohol on property. Um, and you are permitted one guest per room so you can't have any gatherings of like three or four friends over. Um, now, I, I think the college would come back with that and say there's a lot of common spaces that you can meet with people in these hotels. However, that's really only viable, I'd say, in maybe the home two suites where they have the entire hotel as the like rented out. So it's really you can feel safe enough, safe in air quotes, maybe like to go and, you know, commune with your peers there. Whereas at these other hotels, like the Hyatt Regency, they only have a certain number of rooms and everyone else is going to be like tourists and you don't know who's staying next to you. And so you don't really perhaps maybe at like 10 o'clock at night and you need to study and you don't want to take a shuttle to campus or maybe there isn't one to campus. So you're going to go to the lobby of the hotel with four people to go study. You don't know who could walk in there. It's it's there's a lot there's safety concerns that have been raised and also those restrictions like you mentioned. That's Stephen Walker, education reporter at Sarasota Herald Tribune. He's been reporting extensively on New College of Florida. We're also hearing from Mike Sanderson, a New College alum, and you're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa, and we're getting a whole bunch of emails and text messages, which I'll get to in just a second. But I want to ask Stephen, I want to. You mentioned earlier the contract that we have for the home two suites, and you asked for the contract. Between the Hyatt Regency and the college, what kind of response did you get when you asked for that contract? Yeah, so um, at the time of the uh, that I published my story about um, them closing the pay dorms and they sent out that press release, that was August 17th. Um, before that story went up, I reached out to my contacts at their communications office at New College um, haven't heard anything. I sent in a public records request with the uh, legal counsel for New College and their communications department made, made them both tagged on that public records request. I have not received that back. I reached out to the Hyatt Regency, who also hasn't gotten back to me, but I have unconfirmed reports from sources that have talked to me about it that like they people who are looking into this uh, on behalf of maybe their student or a student they know Hyatt Regency at least at the time of the publication was mostly unaware from like a mid-level management down thing uh, level that this was happening um, obviously I, I'm sure they've been filled in and if this was something done up top like between somebody who runs the Hyatt more in a senior position made this decision and now is communicating it with staff, but it's, it seems like it was a very, uh, you know, I don't want to say rushed, but it seems like they came to an agreement before there was a contract set up kind of like they did with the hotels, but it doesn't, it doesn't appear to me that there's a contract right now. I've requested it and haven't received it. So it's noted in all my reporting that there has been no contract provided. So there's really no details yet as to, what restrictions there are. There could be less restrictions at this hotel for all we know. That's likely not the case, but we don't know because the contract's not available. I want to read a couple of these emails and texts that have come in because people apparently feel very passionately about New College of Florida and about the changes that are happening there. Jane Armstrong from Venice actually left a voicemail that uh, was was uh, transcribed for us. And she says, I just want to commend you guys for covering what's going on at New College Sarasota and that it's he 
she calls it a nexus of nonsense. And I really, really appreciate what you're doing to cover on what's going cover what's going on down there and a long term time supporter of the station. So thank you for that, Jane. And we'll continue to cover it. And thanks to, of course, to the alumni and students who are telling us what's happening there and the great reporting from outlets like the Sarasota Herald Tribune. So thanks to Stephen and to Mike as well. So um, I also want uh, this. Someone writes in. This is uh, this comes in from Kurt and says. Thank you for your continued coverage of the debacle at New College. Please tell people about a GoFundMe to pay for lawyers to fight back. And so there is a, a legal action against the state for by by some New College of Florida alumni and students and, and faculty uh, who are who are uh, trying to fight back against some of the state laws. And apparently they have a GoFundMe. So um, Kurt wanted me to let you know about that. And David says, thank you so much for bringing Mike and Steven on your show today. This is an important topic. I'm a new college alum, and I'm so disappointed by these grifters that are taking over. And David goes on to say, I hope that you'll discuss the bizarre and disappointing appointment of David Rancourt as Dean of Students. Rancourt is a greedy lobbyist with zero student affairs experience. What the heck is going on in Sarasota? So maybe you can take that one, Stephen. Uh, what do we know about David Rancourt? Right. So that's something that was reported in Florida politics. I haven't written anything about that, but I am aware of it. And it's something that I have, you know, kind of internalized as part of a larger uh, trend that I'm seeing in New College, where a lot of the people hired are people that are from Tallahassee or people who've worked with Richard Corcoran in some capacity in the past. Um, for example, Kevin Hoft, who's the vice president of enrollment, um, worked at the Florida Department of Education as a policy director with Richard Corcoran. Um I believe uh, Joe Gruder's wife is part of the uh, foundation now for New College. So you, you're you looking at people like even it, it even goes all the way down to like um, somebody who was an athletics employee at Richard Corcoran's wife's uh, charter school in Tallahassee and got a contract with the school to provide food for the end of last semester. It's like you, you can draw all these lines between people and that's just another one too is you're looking at um david rancourt and his history as a lobbyist um it's, it's part of an overarching trend i would say mike do you have anything to add about either david rancourt or any of the others what our our listener is calling grifters getting jobs here or contracts with the new college of florida yeah um you mentioned kevin hope vp of enrollment who has no experience in higher education uh dave rancourt who is never worked in higher education uh, these things are not under the Department of Education. They're under the Board of Governors, which was passed in a constitutional amendment by you know, 61 to 39 in 2002 to remove the politics from the state university system. And particularly Bob Graham, when he Senator Bob Graham, when he posted that was uh, cited what was happening at New College uh, because it's a very small fish. Um, they're treating this like a media situation. Students are learning from press releases that they're not going to have rooms. And instead of communicating to students that they are sympathetic or they're hoping they're bare with them, instead they're putting out press releases blaming the previous administration uh, for things that are not true. And it's really, it's um, just the entire thing is treated as a political situation, as a PR situation, and without respecting their responsibility to the returning students you know, to ensure that they're safe and can finish their education. Um, both, you know, their fiduciary responsibility, the duty of care, and also uh, their responsibility to keep the enrollment up because they're bleeding students and it's going to, you know, it's not sure, like, if they're going to be held accountable for the destruction that they've done, which is, you know, it's unclear if it's malicious or incompetence, but it's just absolutely unnecessary and terrible what's happened here at New College this in 2023. That's Mike Sanderson, a new College of Florida alum, and you're listening to Tuesday Cafe. We also have a guest, Stephen Walker, education reporter at the Sarasota Herald Tribune. And uh, Mike, I'm going to you pointed out something that Richard Corcoran said at a recent, well, in a June Board of Trustees meeting, and I'm going to play a little clip of what Richard Corcoran is talking about here. And it has to do with we're going back to housing now, possibly housing students in a dorm that's called the B dorm. So um, after we hear from Richard Corcoran and about why there are no students being housed in that, what their plans are to potentially demolish it, um, and going back to where we're, people are, aren't living on as many on campus, they're getting sent to these, these um, hotel rooms. So let's hear what Richard Corcoran says, and then I can bring you back in, Mike, to talk about the context of B-Dorm and why, there aren't any, why, why some of the students aren't being housed there instead. 
causes the trustees to vote. So the, the two discrepancies that you talk about, yes, that whole ultimately in the master plan, that whole field um, and pr probably five or six of the challenge plans, all of it was cleared, including the 58th street houses and most of them. So what we're saying is we want to move forward. The wellness plan, because it's not um, part of the Palmer buildings would have to wait. We, we, that demolition wouldn't happen until the fall because we got to go get bog approval for that. The rest we do not. Um, but you guys are authorizing us to do that so we don't have to come back to you. And in the fall, if the wellness bu building's still there, they're they're over capacity, they need more space, um, and, and services are in demand. And so all of that could be accommodated, whether we left them there until the fall we had approval or we moved them but left the building there empty until the fall. That's what we're asking you guys for approval so that we can move forward as qu quickly as possible to transform the campus. So that's the interim president of New College of Florida, Richard Corcoran, talking about transforming the campus. And part of what he's talking about there is this B dorm. So Mike Sanderson, New College alum, what's how, what does this have to do with the students moving into the, the hotels? Yeah, thanks for playing that clip. So B dorm is a 32 bed dorm that's located adjacent to the library. And there are uh, four office buildings there that uh, are in fact scheduled for, slated for demolition. It was a plan approved by the Board of Governors in 2019. I was at that meeting and I since reviewed the plan. Uh, I believe Ms. Richard Corker misstates things there because B-Dorm was not cleared for demolition. Uh, neither was the counseling center. He has plans to put a large building there that may or may not be good, but he could reopen this dorm and bring 32 students back to campus and have them be adjacent to the library. B-Dorm was just renovated within, uh, I think a year ago. And the fact that, uh, he has no master plans for this building he plans to put on this property. And um, there's this housing crisis happening now. Uh, B-Dorm is not in some central location. It's on the corner of this property. He could bring students back there. And the fact that he's not considering that shows that, you know, he's, uh, it's not like pay where there are acknowledged very serious conditions there um, from the, uh, with the mold report. B-Dorm was just renovated. The interim dean of housing confirmed that it's not because they can't put students there. It's simply because Richard Corcoran wants to demolish it, um, which hasn't even been approved by the Board of Governors, as far as I understand. So he could really reopen that dorm and show like that he's trying to help current students come back to campus, but instead he seems to have ruled it out because he simply wants to demolish it, um, which is unlikely to happen in the next four months. Certainly they're not gonna break ground on a new building in the next four months. You know, a lot of this has to do with the kind of turnover of students. We've talked to students in, on this show in the past who are transferring to other schools, a lot of them in the Northeast. And there's also this influx of students. And part of this has to do with athletics. So, Stephen, why don't you uh, give our listeners who aren't familiar with New College of Florida the past and its athletic past and how Richard Corcoran and the Board of Trustees are trying to transform it into a more academic school and what this has to do with the dorm situation. Right. So something that I think the, I think you'd say the board of governors or the governor himself kind of appointed a lot of these trustees. And then in, down the line, Richard Corcoran as the interim to do is to, in, to what they would say, um, improve new colleges numbers. Um, it, it is, a smaller school, um, and they have came forward with metrics that would indicate that new college is struggling. And so they would say, we need to increase enrollment. We need to bring in more students. Um, and so the method by which I would, in my understanding from my reporting that Richard Corcoran decided to do this was by establishing an athletic department. Um, athletics at new college had previously mostly been limited to club and intramural athletics. Um, there's there's been basketball, rowing, powerlifting, sailing, uh, esports, different things like that, but nothing to the extent of like an NAIA um, athletics department competing like in sanctioned games and sanctioned competition, mostly just intramural and club. Um, in March, um, so it was about a month after Richard Corcoran took over as interim, um, he met with the admissions department in an all hands meeting about. Uh, enrollment, uh, and this is something I've reported on and has been contended between members of that staff that were there who spoke with me and I've reported on it and they wish to remain anonymous out of fear of retribution. Uh, and so it's been a point of contention between them and the college of what was said at that meeting. But 
uh, the staff claim that Richard Corcoran was very aggressive, telling them to act in a morally, ethically gray area in recruiting students, um, you know, misrepresenting facilities, saying like, oh, we're, we're, we'll have them when the college doesn't have athletic facilities right now in really any type of extent to field intercollegiate athletics. Um, and the staff contend that Richard Corcoran told the staff to, he, he, he likened getting 300 incoming students to SEAL Team 6 getting Osama bin Laden. And the, the college and Corcoran vehemently deny that he said that. Anyways, 30 minutes after that meeting ended, they sent out a press release to all media outlets that the college is establishing an athletics department. And so it, it seemed very clear from the timing of that meeting and that press release that athletics was their main driving force behind getting new and in, incoming students in a record uh, enrolling. So I, I have some numbers here from my story of the 320 incoming students, 328 incoming students at the time that this was published, more than a third of them were student athletes. And of that 70 of them, at the time were enrolled to play baseball. Um, so you're talking and of the like baseball, it's male. And so, you know, you have this incoming influx of students who are changing the demographic of the college. And so you're looking at changes in, in diversity of the, of the student body, as well as just a massive influx of students that the college was not prepared to take facilities wise. Um, and I think they kind of got caught in it when you know, they were, were, they were prepared to bring in these students and then they realized we have to shut down a whole dorm and they knew that there was issues with the dorm before they just hadn't gotten an official report. And now that they got the official report, we're in the situation where they have too many students coming in, not enough beds for them. So they have to, they, they have like an influx of money from the legislature because of the support that the governor and the state have of the leadership here. So they are just getting funds poured in to pay for this, honestly. And the college wouldn't, I don't think, would have been able to afford hotels like this or thing like a mold report. And they that's what something they point to as well is like, oh, the previous administration let this happen. Um, you know, they didn't do anything about this. Well, you could also argue that I don't think they were in a position to because they didn't they a lot of the funding they would request would be denied. Um and I believe one source told me that uh, they asserted that nobody was in a better position in the last, you know, several years to do something about this problem, even not at New College, as Richard Corcoran did as Speaker of the House and then with the Department of Education and all the polios in Tallahassee. So they would point to the fact that the college, you know, it wasn't that the previous administration didn't do anything about it, it's that they couldn't. And now that they can, you know, we're seeing a lot of shift in dorm shutting, people moving, and it's all just being prompted by the fact that there's more students than they can handle. Well, let's finish this segment with Mike Sanderson, who is an alumnus from New College. And we we just heard from Stephen that there are 70 new baseball players coming in. All of those are new students who are males. Um, what are you seeing as far as the shift from um, uh, an academic institution toward a, a, a sports-based institution? And what about the demographic shift as well that's happening, Mike? Yeah, so I think with athletics, New College has had um, thriving recreational, intramural, and even some intercollegiate support uh, sports, like a thriving intercollegiate sailing team and intercollegiate powerlifting. Um, and the thing to... We have serious questions about how this athletics program is being set up, how it's being funded, what funds these coaches are being paid out of. Um, and we're going to bring some of these concerns also to the Board of Governors. Uh, we uh, To bring it back, also these incoming students, we have evidence they have been misled about things like the athletics facilities and new colleges membership and intercollegiate organizations. But to bring it back to the housing crisis, you know, Corcoran said on July 6th at a board meeting that the incoming class was 294. And now I think it was, um, uh, Stephen said, two, 328. It's now they're saying 340. So he continued to recruit students over the summer, even though, and including recruiting an entire soccer team, uh, mostly somewhat from out of state, people who were still available in July, 
to uh, just drive up these numbers, knowing that there weren't beds, knowing that he had already taken Pedum offline, knowing that pay was in terrible condition. And so it just really shows like, why were they continuing to recruit over the summer, something like 20, 40 people, knowing that they didn't have beds for them, knowing this housing crisis was already developing. And then to spring it uh, in late August, as if they just learned about it days before people moving in, it just really shows you know, the, the pervasive, you know, it's hard to say what their motives are, but this is just a terrible situation that has developed. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you very much, both of you, for coming on Tuesday Cafe, Stephen and Mike. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Stephen Walker is an education reporter at Sarasota Herald Tribune, and Mike Sanderson is a New College alum. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan.